I just started to realize that if a broke single mom fired from Denny's with literally no education and no experience whatsoever could become a millionaire, everybody else can too. Be the change you want to see. Make a difference by giving your money a purpose, a mission to do good. Welcome to Money With Mission, where we show you how to create passive income so that you have options for how to work and how to live your life while leaving a legacy of positive social impact. Hey everyone, welcome back to Money with Mission. I have today Dwan Bent Twyford. Dwan and I have had a chance to spend some time talking to each other. She is in Bailey, Colorado. Dwan is not a physician, but one of our visions, Money with Mission, is that every woman has the financial ability to leave any job or relationship that is not in her best interest. Dwan's story is amazing. She has been through a lot and has gotten a long, long way. So this is going to be exciting. Hang in there and enjoy the show. Welcome to Money with Mission, Dwan. Thank you, Miss Felicia. I'm excited to be on your show today. I'm excited to have you. We spent some time talking. I would like for you to start out telling everybody a bit about yourself. Let me start by telling everybody Dwan is a real estate investor. Yeah. So how did you get there? Did you pop out of your mom as a real estate investor or how did you get <laughs> real estate investing? Uh, no, it, like you, I got married at 29, had a baby at 30. And I honestly thought I would like stay home and have kids and be like the Girl Scout mom and the homeroom mom and the field trip mom and had the disco ball and like beat the fun mom. And when my daughter was only eight months old, her dad and I split up like really unexpectedly. And basically the money, the car, like every, I lost, my car got repoed. Uh, I lost the house of foreclosure. I went through, like it was dark. It was, like my whole world just fell completely apart. And of course my family, you were talking about that earlier. My family's from Ohio. So they're like, oh, you need to come back home and live in Ohio. And my dad says, you could live in your old bedroom and from high school and raise your daughter up here and not have to da -da and make it on your own. And I was living in Florida and I'd already been there a decade. And I loved Florida. And I was like, move back home to a West Mountain, Ohio in my dad's house. We're going to the ocean and I'm like, pray a shark eats me. <laughs> that's <laughs> kind of how I felt. I was like, maybe the shark is a better option. I couldn't even imagine like living under my dad's roof again. So... I literally had no education after high school, no game plan, no plans to do. I didn't have any kind of plan. So I had to get a job. And then I started thinking, like, I waited till I was 30 to have a child for the simple reason that I really wanted to uh, raise her and not put her in daycare. And I just always want to tell people, like, no shame if you use daycare. I just wanted to be like that mom. My mom was there and my grandparents, like, I just wanted to be that person. So I thought, well, I need to either get a job or I need to figure out a way to work for myself. And so I thought, I'm going to work for myself. So honest to God, please, Dylan, I'm telling you, I knew nobody in real estate. I knew no one that had a real estate license. I knew no investors. This is like 1990. There are no REA group. There's no internet. There's like nothing. So when people are like, oh, it's so hard right now. I'm like, we didn't even have pagers. Well, I'm still like where we had to stop and use those stupid telephone. The payphone. Pay right. <laughs> like I was in a half a bag of quarters. I haven't had one with our people that give me all these reasons. I'm like, oh my God. I did it. I'm like pre pager. So honestly, back then we had to find jobs in the classified section. And multi level marketing was really, I think it's always huge. I became aware of it like in the 90s. And I'd go to these meetings. I kept seeing these two guys there all the time. And, and I was like, what do you guys do? And so they said, we buy houses and we fix them up. And we sell them. Okay. Now, I know nothing about real estate. So in my mind, I hear we buy houses, we decorate, and then we sell them. And okay. I thought, I love to decorate. I have excellent taste. All my apartments are really cute. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to decorate a house. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to decorate houses. So I go door knocking. I find a deal. This woman, Barbara, she's kind of in a bad situation like me, too. And I'm like, well, you move out. I'll move in. I'll get it all decorated and fixed. And we'll sell it. We'll split the money. And. She agrees, and, <laughs> and like I'm not even joking. Well, we got the Clark in, and it was all painted. It had custom made blinds. It was the mob custom made blinds. I look. I just remember looking around and thinking, "Wow, this needs like a kitchen. It needs bathrooms. It needs every single thing." 
and I honestly had no skills. I started going to Home Depot and taking live classes. Uh-huh. I took a class on how to lay tile and a tile at the kitchen. Uh, at night, Ana would be sleeping and I'd be building cabinets and making screens. And so I rehabbed a house, rehabbing. And so if you ever question rehabbing and decorating, not the same thing. It's not <laughs> the same thing. And, but I sold this house and made 22,000 bucks on my first deal. And okay. at that time in my life, that was by far the most earned money I'd ever seen or known anyone else to have. And I thought, oh my God, I'm rich. I'm going to be a real estate investor for life. And I moved into another one and rehabbed it, moved into another one and rehabbed it. And by the time Ava started kindergarten, I knew more about wholesaling and various things like that. So I was kind of like a gypsy for a couple of years, just moving, fixing, moving, fixing. But I became really good at it. Yeah. And I thought, what? My daughter's with me. This is fun. I like the work. I like seeing what I did. I'm going to keep doing this. And then it turned into a whole big giant thing. Okay, so I'm going to back up because I know you skipped a lot of steps because you went from my husband left me with my daughter being eight months old. And you said her father, I, the, okay. the guy in my life, left us. And here I am as a single mom. You felt you had high school education. You were in Florida around no family, it sounds like. No. Didn't know anything about real estate investing. Probably knew oh, nothing no. about investing, period. No, so, I were, was raised like get a factory job and get married and have kids. So your thought to me would be, I got to get a job so I can support me and my child. Uh And you went and got a job? I actually did. And it's funny because in my 20s, so my sister had moved down there. So after I I was a little bit older, so after I graduated high school, I said, oh, come live with me in Florida, Ohio sucks. Like, let's go by the beach. So my sister was there. But I got fired from a lot of jobs in my 20s. Like Like a shop. I got fired from Denny's. Okay. Like, I worked 10 at 9 to 6 in the morning, like 3.45, I got sent home. Well, here's that sign. Like, who gets fired from Denny's? So, but I got fired from quite a few jobs, and it was always the same thing. People would say, you're trying to tell people how to do their job better. You just walk up to the owners of the companies and lay on these ideas. I honestly could look at other people's jobs and see what they could do better. Yeah. But I didn't know that that meant I had an entrepreneurial Spirit. Got it. I also thought I was a know it all. <laughs> okay. All right. I really wasn't. And I thought, so I knew enough to know at 30 years old, if I got a job, I'd probably have it till Ada was 18. So I'd be 50. And when you're 30, 50 seems really old. Yeah. Of course, when you get to be 60, you're like, man, I was so hot back then. And I wanted to work for myself because I just didn't have a lot of success working for other people. Okay. But I didn't know what to do. And when I heard these people say they fix up houses, I thought, oh, I like to decorate. And all every apartment, I would paint it and fix them up and make everything really nice. I thought I could do that. That would be really fun. Got so it. it was just sort of a crazy leap of faith. I felt like God opened the door. And I said, okay, well, if I fail, I can get a job. But if I get a job, I'll keep it because that's just kind of how I was ingrained in my mind. Got so it. I did job like right out of the gate because I needed money. So I got a job at a telemarketing place of all things. Telemarketing? Okay. Yeah. Like it was a place that used to run commercials for uh, weight loss vitamins. Okay. Big room with like a hundred chairs and the phone rings and it just bounces to the next operator. And I did that and I thought, I'm really good at sales. I should do something where I'm like selling something. I'm, I'm good at sales. And it's okay. how I feel. And then I see it now. I was knocking on doors or talking to strangers and I put a deal together. You sound like you did a little MLM, multi-level marketing, or you just would go to their conventions or go to their meetings. And that's how you met the two guys that told you about that. I was just going to all the ads in the paper, like, hey, there's a job interview at six o'clock at this hotel. And the first few times I was like, why are there 500 people here? (laughs) I thought this was a job interview for me. And after about three weeks or a month, I was like, okay, every place I go, there's like 200 people. What is happening? And so I realized, that, that all of that, unless you called a specific company, like applied for an actual job, everyone was pitching all the herbal life and the Amway and all of the things are so huge in the 80s and the 90s. So- Got it. So you met those guys. They told you what they did. And then you, the next thing you were doing is knocking on doors. Where did you get the guts? And what were you saying to people when you would knock on their door? Oh. 
My script was bad, girl. It was bad. <laughs> And they said, I asked them, how do you find houses? They said, well, we go up to the courthouse. So this is be Palm Beach County, Florida. Uh-huh. We go to the courthouse and we handwrite all the foreclosures. And we use that map book and we map them out. And we go knock on the doors. Uh-huh. And there's people losing their house and tell them we'd like to buy their house. And then we fix it up. So I'm still thinking, so I'm going to buy a house. I'm going to decorate it. We're going to sell yeah. it. We're going to split the money. Got it. So my first couple deals. It's funny now because I made these deals and my first couple of deals were with women and we literally had like a hug and a handshake and okay, I'm going to do this and you're going to do this. I've got no paperwork. I mean, if, if someone came to me now and said, I did a deal and a hug and a handshake, what do you think? I'd be like, no, what's wrong with you? You can't trust anybody. So I would go to the courthouse, take my daughter, write all the addresses, use a map book. I'd just go door knocking and I would literally just say, I see that you guys are in foreclosure and I'd like to work with you and fix up your house and sell it. And like, we could split it and okay. still not knowing that I'm going to be rehabbing yeah. until the first one. Then the first one, I was like, oof, I don't know. Do I want to do that again? I'm a big learning curve because I did not do anything. I knew how to paint. And the second one, I was like, oh, I learned enough. I could rehab another one. I think I can do yeah. it. And I found a smaller house. Yeah. And the people were like, yeah, we'd like to work with you. And I said, okay, so I'll fix it up and you make the payment and then we'll split the money. And like, I was just like making these deals with you. I was like crazy. I honestly, if it was not for God, there's no chance I'd be here doing deals because my first three or four deals, I didn't even have paperwork. I didn't even know about that stuff. Yeah. And the money and everybody was honest. And split the money, and you got thank you God. got paid. They got paid. They got out of their house. They everybody moved on. Yeah, thank God. And then by like the second deal, everyone's like, "Oh, how'd you get them in a contract?" And I was like, mm-hmm. "Contract? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know exactly what you're asking." And, I, and I'm not a Florida real estate contract. Someone gave me, and it was like eight pages long. And I said, "Oh my God, I have to learn all this. I don't even know what these words mean. I don't even know half the words in this contract." I don't know. By my third deal, I I knew about contracts. I knew about paperwork. Yeah. Uh, real estate group had opened in the area. So I went to a meeting. It was like 80 people there. And I thought, oh my gosh, look at all these investors. So I would ask me, like, what do you do? And I'm like, oh, I'm a rehabber. I was like, yeah, I guess I am too. <laughs> I didn't know, but I guess I am too. And so I started off rehabbing. And then I switched over to wholesaling. Where I could just get it and sell it to a rehabber. Uh-huh. And then it changed for me. Once I was able just to, to wholesale the house to somebody else, I started making just oodles of money, just money, money, money. I made like hundreds of thousands of dollars. I thought, oh gosh, why is everyone in the whole world not doing this? This is the best thing ever. Got it. So this is really interesting to me. So first off, I'm going to go back to high school education, made money on your first ones, learned about contracts after you'd done it a few times. Oh my gosh. So you stepped into it. You didn't go back and stand back and read a thousand books and figure out how to do it and then make sure you didn't make any mistakes. Like, I'm just going to do it. And sometimes yeah. when we're young, it's easier to do that, right? You can just say, I'm just doing it. Let's just go. I, so many I always, times as we get older, go ahead. Yeah. Now, I tell people all the time, I said, honestly, my biggest asset back then is I was naive. Mm-hmm. I didn't know. There could be things wrong with the house. I didn't know a whole house could need full-blown electricity. I didn't know a house could be full of termites. Like, I didn't know. And I really did think I was just going to decorate, get blinds, like, put the furniture, put the plants, take the pictures. And, be done. Yeah. And, and being naive, honestly, if I had known all the things I know now, I don't think I would have just stepped into that so easy because I could have found a million ways to talk myself out of it. Yeah. A hundred percent. hundred percent. So, first bad deal. Your first time things went bad, what happened? Well, I had a couple of deals. I know I have to say, I've never actually lost money on a house. Okay. I had one deal specifically. I was going to make like 35000 bucks on this house. I was going to rehab it. And I remember going to, now I know about contracts. and like, I know how to do stuff. And I know how to like estimate repairs and things. I remember going to this house. And there were all these bugs, just so many bugs in the house. I thought, oh, yeah, I'm not the tent this house. There's bugs everywhere. So I buy the house. I have this much money for a budget. I've got a couple guys can help me. I'm going to make this much money on it. Anyway, it turns out that those were termites. <laughs> so, uh, 
I did not know what a termite was. I did not know that they eat everything. And this house, like even the roof trusses were eating, like everything was eaten alive by these termites. So I called these guys. I'm like, oh, we're going to put a tent on the house. And they're like, girl, you can't. You got to redo this whole roof, like all the trusses, like everything in this house is like eaten to the bones from these termites. So that house took months to do. I used every dollar of profit I ever would have possibly made. It was all said and done. I made like 2,600 bucks and it took months. And I thought, gosh darn. And I realized right then you could go bankrupt on one wrong deal. Okay. So I'm like out there having to learn about sister beams and I go to Home Depot and like, tell me about these trusses, like what's going on. And I have a contractor and he's like, you should honestly just tear this out. It's so bad. And I was like, but it's got a beautiful pool and it's a four two. It's like a split plane. It's a great house. But I mean, the cabinets, all of it. And it costs, so you're looking back like 25 years ago. 35 additional thousand dollars on a rehab in addition to the 20 I was thinking about spending that's a massive rehab that long ago yeah how far into it were you at that point I bought it and closed on it and had a guy come over and say okay I had a guy in a, I think it was his name his name was Jay or something like that and he was like one of the first people I hired to help me like to you know so I could do more than one house at a time I had a little bit of money got and- it and I said, I'm going to call this company and send this house. What do you think it's going to cost? And he looks around and he's like, you need to come up this ladder. And he's showing me the trusses. And I mean, it's just, you can just get anything. It's just and like, house is gonna fall. and yeah. I'm like, why would the bank, first of all, not tell me that, but I had time to do an inspection. I saw the bugs. I saw it. It was full of these little white things with the wings. They're all over me. And I didn't know. So. When I took the guy there with me for the first time, he starts showing me, and I can just feel my heart sink. I thought, I'm so over my head right now. I don't know enough to do anything structural. I know nothing about structural. I do carpet paint. I put in kitchens and bathrooms and screens, and I pressure wash, and I put landscaping out. Like, that's mm-hmm. what I know how to do. Mm-hmm. So it was, it was a big learning curve, and I helped. Though. I got up in there, and I learned on the house, and I learned more about the bugs, the treatment, the termites, all the things. And so then after that, if I'd see a house like that, I would know. If it got termites, I didn't want to go to it. I'm never doing that again. That was the one time where it was a one and done of learning that lesson. <laughs> got it. Got it. Got it. No, oh, I don't have one time that was fire damage. Well, I didn't know. It was started in the master bathroom. So the insurance company fixed it up. But I didn't realize the fire damage, they put water on the entire house. So the whole entire side of the house had been soaked with water and all the drywall becomes like powder. Yeah. So I touch the wall and you fall through it to the other room, which I actually did. All the way into the other room, flat on my ass. It's like, where is this all over me? I learned about water damage. So a lot of it happened, but I was made a little on those. But after a while, I was like, I got to have everything inspected because I've been making some bad decisions here. <laughs> when did you, when did you come with your, um, I can't think of the words to call it, but you say people before profits. When did that become your thing? When did the money become less of an issue for you? Well, the, the first house I did, her name was Barbara and she was single. She had 25 year old son. She was a hoarder, too. I didn't know what a hoarder was until those TV shows came on. And her husband had left her kind of high and dry, and her son was like a bum. Why aren't you mowing the yard and working for your mom? Like, you're 25 years old. Get your ass out there and work for happy mom. And so she was in as bad a situation as I was. But she had a job. Mm-hmm. And, I, and when I helped her, I so said, the first deal, I was just like, I got to make money. I got to make money because I don't make money. I'm living on credit cards. I'm getting buried in debt. And I keep thinking, I don't want to move back to my dad's house. Yeah. That's the thing that's like, I don't want to do that. So the first deal, I was really just about, I thought, like, I just want to help her and she's helping me. And we're doing this sort of like as a team. And then the second, there were a couple, three houses. And then pretty soon I thought, really, it's not about the money. It's about the people because they're all in foreclosure. And I just went through one and it sucked. And so if I just help them... I'll make money too, because they're all like with me. Like, hey, what can we do to help? How do we make this happen? How do we 
get ourselves into a better situation. So my first deal was though, it's like, I got to make money. I don't care what I'm, I got to make something. Yeah. After the second or the third deal, I was just like, what? All these people are just like me. They're crying. They're upset. A lot of them got a divorce. Husband took off. Wife took off. It's like so many similar things. And I thought, okay, I can help people and I can make really good money. And I was really enjoying the rehabbing at the time. I'm in my 30s. You're strong. I can like, I can lift everything. I can use all the tools. And I'm like, look at me. Like, got a garage full of tools now. And, and so I think it just kind of always was that way. Okay. And I remember a few times some deals came across my plate. And I thought, man, I don't know. This is not a very good deal for the homeowner. And plus I, I'm going back to church and God's weaving and sewing. It's like, you're going to reap what you sow. And there was a few deals that came across that were not good for the homeowner. I thought, I just, I don't think I should do that. I think if I don't help them, because nobody helps me. Yeah. If I don't help them and I start making it all about the money, I feel like that's not going to keep opening these doors and keep blessing me. So I was kind of that way from the beginning. And then more so as I went along, because I would just meet more and more people with, and hear their stories. Like, oh my God, like you don't need someone to help you. That's, that's not going to just make it about them and give you like $5 to move with. Yeah. I agree a hundred percent. Um, keeping the person and people in front of everything will always make you do better. It just the um, body line. It, you're always going to do better that way. So for, fast I forward. My God, hit me with a lightning bolt. <laughs> <laughs> you already I got just, hit with a lightning bolt. You didn't need another one. Out there. I'm doing yeah. good yeah. down here. People, exactly. like, you just hang on all those lightning bolts out there. I thought my grandparents used to tell me, I'm going to hit you with a lightning bolt. You know? Like, here and over until my adulthood is like, don't do that. No. Did you ever go back to Ohio? Did you ever end up in your dad's place again? Or you you made it happen from no, Florida? I made yeah. it happen. I made it happen. I mean, obviously to visit and stuff. But now I stayed there and I did those first couple of deals where I had money. And plus I was living in each rehab. So it wasn't like paying rent and living over here. And when after when Ava started school, when she was in kindergarten, I was living in a rehab in Boca Raton, Florida. Okay. Like Boca's like, we're all like the rich people. And I was yeah. like, what, living in the house with all the rich people. And I got this house for a quarter of the value. I thought I was going to live here. I'm going to live in Boca. And thinking I'm all that, so I'm living in Boca. But what I found out is I couldn't stand the people in Boca. <laughs> They're so snotty and they're so like all about money and all about like fashion and design. And you got to have the right card. And I thought, oh, my God, who are these people? Yeah. So I did. I ended up, I was like, so I moved over to another town called Delray Beach. I thought, okay, uh -huh. regular people live over here. <laughs> I actually know someone in Delray Beach now. So you, you live in Colorado now and you have a lot of your properties, commercial properties in Clinton, Iowa. Talk about how, talk about what you're doing in Clinton, Iowa. You guys, this might be the next AG, HGTV show. So listen, they're doing a lot. Yeah, it oh, would be ahead. great. I would be like, I would love to have a show. Like, here's what we did. So I was single for a long time. I did not marry my husband until my daughter was 13. So I was a decade of being a single woman. I ran a business. I bought a house. I lived on a lake. I was a mop on the beach. I had a good boat. I got a car. I got rentals. I all the stuff. And so when I met Bill, I was just like, Okay, so here's the deal. I love Florida. I also love the mountains. I'm willing to commute and this and that, but nobody's going to come in here and like start telling me how to run what I'm already doing. So mm -hmm. we want to work together. That's great, but we're not going to squash everything I've just done. So we started working together and doing houses and all the things. He was a real estate investor as well. And both of us always go back to our high school reunion. So every five years, we're going back to Clinton. And the first reunion we went to, I don't think we were even married yet. And I thought, oh, this little downtown looks like it used to be so cute. So it's on the Mississippi River. And Clinton is a pretty big city. But like out here, they built like the casino and the Walmart and the Target. Like everything's out there. And this little downtown, it's three blocks this way and three blocks off the river. So it's only nine little square blocks. And it looks like it was just left to die. Okay. And most of the buildings are boarded. There were a few people that had business visits. And the first time I said, oh my gosh, look how cute this town is. We should buy a building. Then we did. And then the next five years, it's like, oh, oh the town, like, it needs so much love. It needs someone to come in. And then like the next time, and then, so that would have been like maybe seven years ago or something. 
And I said, we should talk to somebody and see if they're doing anything, like any kind of rebeautification or if they're doing something. And so we found out this little downtown is an opportunity zone. They have a special downtown alliance. The people in those buildings pay their taxes into this fund that goes back into the downtown. And they were just, nobody was buying any new buildings. People had businesses from like 100 years ago, and no one was buying any buildings. So I thought, well, we'll buy one. And then I know you don't know, but Bill and I, our risk factor is like way over here off of the chart. So then we're like, okay, we'll buy another one. And then someone says, hey, I heard just bought so-and-so's building. Will you buy my building? And next thing, all the women around town are widows. They've had these buildings sitting there for a decade, and they all want to get rid of their buildings, and they all want to sell them to us. So then I was like, listen, we have to stop by match like 10. I was like, Bill, we have to stop. Like, we don't, we have to fix these buildings up. And then we fix up three of them actually during COVID. And we opened a business inside of the buildings to help bring people downtown. And then some more people like, hey, I got, a, and then the bank called, but I got five lots over here. I'm like, no, we don't want that. He's like, no, you just, you just make payment. No money down. You can just make payments. We're like, no, no. Oh, we bought those two. <laughs> So there was one big giant building called the Wilson Building. It's the largest building downtown, six stories. It's all marble. Like, it's all handmade. It used to just be, you could just tell it was beautiful. Yeah. So they've had some company bought it, I don't know, like seven or eight years ago. just had a big window sticker coming soon. They're going to put these locks in there. So when we started pushing this thing, like, hey, listen, we've been buying buildings for five years. That building's sitting there. Like, they needed to get going. Like, a month ago, opened up this building. It's six stories. It's full of really expensive, trendy lofts. It's got a big, giant food court in it. And all kinds of people are coming downtown. And that block behind it is an old hotel, like where movie stars used to stay. Someone bought that. They're putting $27 million into that and making apartments there. And this summer, for the first time in the history of Clinton, that it's on the river. So there's like a big band show in a park right on the river. They're doing a thing called Tailgate and Tall Boys. And it's a three-day country music festival. With like Tim McGraw, really famous people. And yeah. some of those people are going to pour into Clinton it, within the next month. And I was like, what? We did. You started it. You did started it. it. And, you... and all kinds of people bought buildings. And we met other investors like, hey, you guys bought buildings. They look great. We're going to buy some too. And now most of the downtowns are snapped up. Huh. That's pretty exciting. So it's crazy. Gonna, you guys started a rehab of a city. You brought a city back. That's amazing. Is that where Palo Windows is? Is that where that factory used to be? Or is it still there? Maybe it's not the right city. I think so. Clinton okay. has a massive factory. I mean, it's miles and miles long. And they actually uh, make bottled water. They make the bottles out of corn. Huh, okay. They make them out of corn. It's like a $6 billion factory. And it's it's outside of town, but it's like miles and miles. And it smells terrible because it smells like that, that burning corn yeah. syrup. Yeah, but they put that there, and that's the only. And they, I don't know why they chose Clinton, but they put that in before we started it. But they put six billion dollars, and then that employed a bunch of people. And then, and then we also have single family homes around the downtown. Our kids own, we own, and um, I try to help you know, provide nice houses for people. And yeah, they they built a, a really nice big giant prison that's over the river, and that employs like a thousand people, and they're all living in Clinton because it's cheaper than living in Illinois, which is literally across the bridge. Okay. That's pretty, that's pretty exciting. I'm sure you can look at that and have a lot of pride and excitement in the fact that you have to revitalize this town. Did you guys have investors help you with that or did you do that out of your own pockets? Well, the first couple of buildings we just paid for, like the very first building was right on the corner. It's like the cornerstone building, the entire downtown, beautiful building. And we only paid thirty five thousand dollars for twenty thousand square feet. Okay. We're like, we're buying that. Yeah. And then we rehabbed it inside, and we actually put an antique mall in because a lot of people like the antique in Midwest. Yeah. Yep. I mean, I'm like, well, okay, we don't know anything about antiques, but what if we rent all these spaces to people and we have an employee there? We don't need to know about antiques. We just have to have a cool location. And we started a boutique like that, and then we started a coffee shop. Never <laughs> bother day. But then, so all the buildings are just really inexpensive. So in the first 
maybe five or six, and someone would call and say, hey, my friend, like Carla, you bought her building. We used to hate mine. And so what we did is we said, well, we don't want any more buildings. So if you'll order finance them to us with no money down, we will take them. Okay. So the first 10, no. honest to God, every, except for the first one, we paid cash for. But then she told her friend, and then she called us, and then we bought her three, and then she told her friend, and then they called us. And so the first 10 were all paid for. They were mostly widows that have been sitting there for like a decade. And they they had to do, the deal was if you could do 100% owner financing. Yeah. No money down at all. And they were all wanting to go to Florida. So, well, now you check in Florida every month. So we got 10 of them without any money out of our pocket, except for the first one for 35000 Got it. And so then how did you... How did you afford to rehab them? Did you was that all out of your pocket too? The rehab, or were you able to get some equity money out of the bank or something to help you rehab those buildings? A little bit of both. We have a, a lot of students I teach, and I have a, you know podcasts, and I teach seminars all over the country. And we have a lot of students like, hey, I would like to invest some money, but I don't know where or what. Like, would you invest some money for us? And we're like, sure. Yeah. Like, we're working on this building. If you want to invest, like, whatever, two hundred thousand dollars, we'll pay you this much money we'll do interest only yeah like three okay. year long then we'll refinance it so we have some people that invested not in the purchase of the buildings but the rehabbing gotcha some of these buildings were sitting like one's a three-story building it's beautiful downstairs it's got fireplace it's all brass it's beautiful but it's got a massive roof leak that's just like sucked all the way down <laughs> building like, yeah like, the body is it doesn't stop buying building no more building so we're done <laughs> so it sounds like if you had investors, they were debt, it was debt money and you were paying them interest and you refinance, got them out of the deal. Now you guys own all those buildings. That's a great way to do it. And that helps. I mean, then the investor's not in it for too long. They're, they're going to get interest for a, probably a higher interest rate than they get just having the yeah. money sitting in the bank, right? Yeah. But we have personally, we have $2 million in our own personal money there. Mm -hmm. and like mm -hmm. I was telling you, people are like, oh, but what if downtown doesn't turn around? What if this, what if that? I was like, so I just always said, I can't imagine that as long as we prayed over it and as, as easy as all the deals like fell into our lap, yeah. I can't imagine it's not going to turn around. And if it doesn't blow up and become explosive, at least all the buildings provide, uh, they generate income. Yeah. Yes. And if when you look at how many people you helped, all these women were, or these people were holding these buildings that were doing nothing for them, but taking money out of their pockets, their liabilities for those folks. Now you've turned them into assets for them so they can go do what they want to do, pay yeah. them for that building. It's great. It's perfect. And, and it's funny because they were mostly widows. I'm like, oh, my husband's been dead a decade. And, and so the buildings, some of them were rented, but some they just didn't put any money in them. Like nothing was ever put into them. And these are some of these buildings are found like in the early 1900s, really beautiful old buildings. And they have all these facades that people came through town and put on like in the 60s or the 70s or all the showy stuff. So we're tearing everything back and we're restoring them like they used to look because yeah. they're beautiful. I'm, I can't wait to go through Clinton, Iowa to see it. I'm, I'm Girl, excited. If you're ever coming that. through there, you let me know and I'll make sure that I am there. I'm Once found out uh, about a month ago, the downtown property values have already gone up 45%. Okay. Which I was like, okay, I think yeah. so. We kind of helped that start. And then this giant tailgate thing, they talked about and talked about it and said, oh, we got to put Clinton back on the map. People have bought buildings. They've redone the, the streets and the light poles and the lights that hang on, all the stuff that makes it cute. And this giant, massive thing is coming there. And I said, they do that and they start doing that every year. That's what brings Clinton back. So nice. Nice. Dwan, what's next for you? Where where are you going next? Where do you see yourself in the next one, two, three, five? How far out in the world and you want to go? Yeah, I don't even know. I want to finish all of the buildings. And I mean, some of them we just do like a floor and then we let it sit, and then we do a floor. And you know, I feel like we've got at least five more years. It started off to be a five-year project. So I think we still have five. <laughs> but my husband got sick. And so for two years, we dealt with all that. So now we're like back on track. So I feel like five years should be, everything should be done from the ground to the sky. And I don't know. I told God, if this everything keeps doing like it's doing, 
I feel like maybe we could pick up a few neighborhoods and try to bring up a few little opportunity zones, pick uh-huh. up some neighborhoods. Maybe we could like build like some housing for people and so I see myself more and I guess maybe more into just the commercial side for a while. Okay. All right. And I do know that you're teaching. Talk about what you're doing as far as teaching and you're speaking and all those kinds of things. How are you helping other people get into real estate? So thanks for asking about that. That's one of the things I start doing like way back. I had only done about four or five deals and they opened up. It's called a RIA, Real Estate Investors Association, meetups, yep. something like that. But there were meetups back then because, again, no internet. So a local real estate group opened up and I noticed that there were a lot of men there, just a couple girls. And I thought, but I just, when I didn't know much, I'd be like, hey, listen, why don't you get film over to my house? Let me talk to you about what I do. And let's try to help more people and like spread it around. Now I was doing little seminars at my house. And I didn't really know enough. I would say, this is all I know. So take this and like go help people. And somewhere along the way, uh, other real estate investing groups started asking me to come there and teach. And I was like, you mean like speak in front of people? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> well, the first place I spoke, there had 700 people there. I remember standing up there and I was sw- dripping in sweat. I was like, oh my God, I'm going to die. Why did I agree to do this? And I was like, oh, my stomach. I was a wreck. I was a, such a wreck. But I did it. I was like, oh, that's kind of fun. And then, I don't know, I started doing a lot of short sales. And a publishing company reached out to me and said, hey, because uh, I was a Gary Keller, uh-huh. Keller Williams. Yep. I was then yep. his book about the real estate millionaire investors, or, or, or I, I should have the title, I don't know the title. And then a couple of publishing companies reached out and said, hey, would you want to write a book? And I was like, yeah, I'll write a book. So I wrote two books. And then a few years later, I wrote a book with Steve Forbes. And I was like, wow, look at all this stuff that's happening. And, and I just started to realize that if a broke single mom fired from Denny's with literally no education and no experience whatsoever could become a millionaire, everybody else can too. And I just really, and I, that's one of the reasons I podcast, I write books, I do blogs, is because I feel like everyone has, like you do, you, people have the chance to get out of this job that they went to college for. Yeah. Or that, you know, like you said, someone becomes a lawyer and they think, oh, this is it for the rest of my life I'm dead. But it's not. And yeah. now people are getting ready to retire and they're like, I don't have enough money to live on. And so I just, I don't know. I just started teaching and. At this point, I've actually sold over 500,000 training programs. Good. That's, that's amazing. So what I, what, one of the things that you said is I went and I started teaching people when I, didn't, when I didn't even feel like I knew that much. But you knew more than the people that you were talking to. And that's all we, we just got to be a little, we got to be in front of people that want to do what we're doing, but we don't yeah. have to know everything about what we're doing because we want to help people soon, not, not once you got there all the way. It's really yeah, important exactly. that you help people along the way. I, I love start that. helping people rehab. And I would always say, oh, so rehabbing from decorating, not the same thing. And then I learned how to wholesale. So I would have like like 10 people from the RIA group would come and I'd say, okay, here's what I know about wholesaling. And then, so I did mostly wholesaling to rehabbers and landlords. And then I started buying rentals. I didn't know anything about rentals. Everyone was, you know, I told them, here's my mom, number number, call me when you need something. And you know, everyone became my best friend. And, trying to get out of paying rent. And I was like, oh my God, what am I doing? So I actually got rid of my first batch of rentals. I went to like a four day workshop to learn how to be a landlord because it's a special skill. And, but even like with all the commercial buildings we've done, I still don't feel like I could say to someone, listen, let me just show you how to turn a town around. Like, I feel like I need to get further into that. Yeah. All the way to get to that point, I can help you with pretty much everything (laughs) to that. Sounds like you turn a town around one building at a time. You do. One building at a time, one house at a time. That's how you turn a neighborhood around, one house at a time. It just, it, it, it takes time, but it's very, very possible. I'd love your story, Dwan. You've written books. Oh, I want to wait. Before I get to that, you use some words, short sale and wholesaling. And I want to make sure everybody understands what those words mean. So can you just explain those words? Yeah, so it's short sale. Basically, if I was working with you, you're a homeowner in distress, you have a $300,000 house, you owe $300,000 on the house, I would call the bank and say, hey, I need you to take a short sale. So that would be the bank agreeing to take maybe $150,000. 
as a full payoff. So I'm working with the homeowner, but I'm getting the bank to agree to take less as a full payoff. So now I get this because I know you don't know this. Well, you might know this, but I don't think so because I, I don't put it out there. I started doing short sales in the 90s because I was wholesaling houses, flipping them. I, so when I say wholesaling, this is before HGTV, before they ruined all the words. Yes. This house is not, that's not wholesaling. <laughs> yeah, no. no. Then, so I would get them in the country, sell, get them in the sell, get them in the sell. Then mm -hmm. the numbers started getting really tight and I'd call the banks and say, hey, listen, like, by, I, this was totally by accident. Like, hey, can you knock off like $2,000 in fees? Like, yeah, we can do that. Then I call and say, hey, I got the closing statement. And last week it was this much. Now there's like $4,000 of extra fees on there. And I started getting the banks to take money off. And after about six of deals, I thought, dang, all these deals I've done before, I could have called the bank and asked them to waste some fees. So then I started asking the bank to take off some of the balance of the house. Mm -hmm. Back then, they were calling them short sales, shorting it, discounting it, shorting the mortgage. It wasn't a real term for it. So I actually trademarked short sales. So the trademark and short sales, as it applies to real estate investing, I have owned that trademark for like 25 years. And people are using it. I use it all the time. Short oh, sales. Oh, they didn't know that. Look it up. On real estate, I have the trademark. And I just actually called the attorney yesterday because I, I know it's coming out for renewal next year. I was like, hey. Keep don't it. Let, don't, don't let, let that go. Bye -bye. Don't let that go. My trademark. But it's called a supplemental trademark because short sales is used in other industries. Okay. My stock market. But oh, yes, it's yes. still good to R because I, it's, I'm using it for real estate. Got it. I have the R. So I am literally the queen of short sales. And short sales really became a word used that I learned in the 2008, 2009 time. And yeah. now foreclosure, short sales, got it. And just to be clear, a short sale is when you can buy a property for less than is owed on the property. The bank takes that, whatever that money is, as the, as the price that they're selling it for. A full payment. And wholesaling so, is and wholesaling. My book, short sale pre-foreclosure investing. Perfect. And on my book, there's a little R, and I was like, yeah, that's right. The girl's got an R. <laughs> I love it. Wholesaling is you take a property, put it under contract, and you may have to put a little bit of money in there just to get it under contract, and then you flip the contract or sell the contract to a, um investor, yes. rehabber, whatever. You don't, you don't really own it. You don't buy it. You don't touch it. You don't paint it. You don't close on it. You just wholesale it over here. And it's funny because I rehabbed for about five years and then I discovered wholesaling and I was like, oh my God, I could just sell to somebody else and do all that work. Yeah. I was used to putting in a lot of hours. I will sell 75 deals in my first year. Nice. Nice. He's like, how'd you do that? And I'm like, well, I, I didn't have anything to compare it to. So I didn't know if that was good or bad or a lot or a little. I just knew that I wasn't rehabbing. So I had all this extra time. And people were like, dang, girl. And I was like, that is a lot, right? I, I was like, wow, well, I, I'm doing a lot of business compared to all these other people, this RIA group. And they're all men. And here's little old me over there by myself. Not, oh, not like and, crazy. And some of it's because you didn't know. Like you said, I didn't know what was good. I didn't know it was a lot. I'm just out there doing my thing, taking care of business because I have the things I have to take care of. I have my children to take care of. I want to make sure that my little girl's don't have the same kind of issues that you have you that's you just want to make life better for your next generations i love it so much duan how can people get in touch with you because i know they're going to want to <laughs> well so i took my name duan and i added wonderful and i made duanderful now d-w-a-n-d-e-r-f-u-l duanderful and if they go to duanderful.com they'll get a free ebook Flip your way to a fortune. I literally made my first million dollars flipping houses. So flip your way to a fortune. I'm on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, all the stuff. But dwandiful.com and get your ebook. Jump on some webinars. Let me teach you what I know. And I will help you set your path straight financially. I have 180 videos up on training videos on YouTube. So I'm just kind of everywhere, and I'm on TikTok, Dwantastic on TikTok, and I'm just trying to okay. educate and help people learn, and, and I always just say, look, I'm telling you, if, if someone like me can do it, anybody can do it. I love it so much. Hey, are you going to be speaking anywhere? If anybody wants to just get out there and see you? If they go to my website, wonderful.com, there's a calendar. Okay. 
the real estate investing groups are all over the country and they always are like, hey, come speak at my group soon. So what we do is we'll go speak at their group and do what's called an evening presentation and they will stay in town and do an all-day Saturday and all-day Sunday. Perfect. So I call it my two-day cash in a flash foreclosure summit. And my husband and I, for two days, we just teach about every little thing and they're really fun and we love to do them. It's super educational. And so come and see me somewhere and say hi and tell me that you saw me on the Money with Mission show. Perfect. Juan also has a podcast. It is called the most wonderful real estate podcast ever. Perfect. Please go, listen to her podcast, rate, subscribe. Let's help us grow both of our podcast audiences and we can just keep spreading the word about real estate investing. We both want every woman to have the financial ability to leave any job or relationship that is not in her best interest. Yeah. Until next time, you guys, thanks for listening. You've been listening to Money With Mission. There are projects happening right now where you can have a great financial return while positively affecting the lives of others. To learn more about our opportunities, go to moneywithmission.com.